Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You are going to hear a travel agent discussing a holiday booking with two customers. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, good morning. We'd like to book a holiday for July, please. Certainly. Where did you have in mind? Oh, well, we haven't thought a lot about it, really. We'd just like to go somewhere hot, you know, and it must be in July. I see. Well, let's get the dates cleared up first, then we can see about availability. What part of July were you thinking of? Oh, well, you see, we have slightly different holidays. I've got the whole month except for the last five days, so I could go from the 1st to the 26th. But my friend here doesn't start until the 7th, so I suppose it will have to be the middle two weeks, really. Yes, but I've got to be back before the 23rd. OK. Now, let's find a destination. Any preferences? France? Italy? Oh, not France. We went there last year, and it was absolutely packed with teenagers, making noise and getting drunk all the time. Yes, it was terrible. We definitely want somewhere quieter this year. Well, of course, it depends more on the resort rather than the country. There are resorts in every country which cater for the family or the slightly older person. They're usually a shade more expensive, though, as you might expect. Oh, well, we don't mind paying a bit more if it means more peace and quiet, do we? Definitely not. It'll be well worth it. All right. Let's have a look at what we've got on the computer. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. July. Was it 10 or 14 nights you wanted? Oh, the fortnight, please. Right. Well, let's start with Italy. Um, we've got 14 nights, bed and breakfast in Sorrento for £345 from Manchester on the 14th. Or we've got... No, wait a minute. That's no good for me. We wouldn't get back till the 28th, and I've got to be back at work before that. Ah, yes. Um, how about Sweden? Two weeks, half board? How much would that be? That would be £540, from Manchester again. Well, £540... Uh, that seems too much. Well, madam... There's a surcharge for the airport, and it has a five-star hotel. Oh, well, it's a bit over our budget, really. All right, let's try somewhere else. How about Portugal? Oh, that sounds great. We've never been there before, have we? Let's see now. We've got 14 nights in Albufeira, half board, from Gatwick, for £385. Albufeira? Oh, wait a minute. Did you say the flight was from London? That's right, from Gatwick. Oh, well, we'd prefer a flight from the north somewhere. Manchester, perhaps, or even Glasgow.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Mr. Jackson, who feels that he is physically unfit, is consulting with his doctor about his health condition. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Well, Mr. Jackson, the first and important thing I have to tell you is that um, there is really nothing seriously wrong with you. Physically, that is. My, uh, my very thorough re-examination and the, the analyst's report show that basically you are very fit. Yes, very fit. So, why is it, Doctor, that I'm always so nervy, tense, Ready to jump on anybody, my wife, children, colleagues. I think, um, I think your condition has a lot to do with, um, shall we call it, way of life, habits. Way of life? Habits? Yes, now tell me, Mr. Jackson, you smoke, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I do, Doctor. And uh, rather heavily, I imagine. Well, yes. I smoke, what, about 40, 50 a day, I suppose. You should do your best to stop, you know. Yes, I see. But, uh, well, it won't be the first time. I've tried to give up smoking several times, but it's, it's no good. You see, 50 a day is overdoing it, you must admit. You must cut down at least that. Oh, yes. I know that when you're feeling tense, you, you, you probably feel that a cigarette relaxes you. But in the long run, I do advise you to make, to make a real effort to quit smoking. Of course. But, well, it's easy to say give it up or cut it down. But, oh, you know. Well, in my opinion, you have no choice. Either you make a real effort or, or there's no real chance of your feeling better. You see... Well, obviously, I could prescribe some kind of tranquilizer, but would that help? I'd prefer, and I'm quite sure you'll agree, I'd prefer to see you really back to normal, not just seemingly so. And that's my reason for asking you several more questions about, about your other habits. Right. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Your eating habits, for example. What do you eat normally, during a normal day? Yes, well, I'm a good eater. Yes, I'd say I'm a good eater. Now, let's see. Up at eight in the morning, and my wife has a good breakfast ready. A good breakfast? The usual. 
a cereal followed by bacon and eggs with fried bread and perhaps a tomato or two, then toast and marmalade, all washed down with a couple of cups of tea. I uh yes, I really enjoy my breakfast. Uh yes, I can see you do, but I'd advise you to eat rather less. We'll come to that later. Go on. Then lunch. No, first brunch. A cup of coffee and a bun at eleven. Lunch has to be quick because there's so much to do in the office about that time. So I have a pint and a sandwich in the pub. All very hurried. Try to be in less of a hurry. But I make up for it in the evening. I get home at about seven. Dinners around about eight. Uh, yes, my wife's an excellent cook. Excellent. It's usually some meat dish, and we like spaghetti as a first course. Spaghetti, a meat dish, cheese, sweet. But uh, but then at the end of the day, shall we say, then? Well, then I begin to feel on edge again. Most evenings after dinner, we read or watch TV. But I I get this terrible feeling of tension. Well, I'm sorry to have to say this because you obviously enjoy your food, but、um, I really do recommend that you that you eat less, and secondly, that you eat more healthily. Instead of having that enormous breakfast, for example,、um, well, try to be content with fruit juice and some cereal. I see, but、uh... eleven says right. Well, that's all right. But lunch should be more leisurely. Remember, your health is at stake, not your job. As for dinner,、um, I'd advise you to eat a soup, perhaps with a salad. A salad followed by some fruit. But my wife's cooking is superb. Granted, and she probably enjoys preparing delicious meals for you. If you like, well,、um, I'll have a word with your wife. No. That won't be necessary.、Uh, thanks, just the same, Doctor. But no. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a female and a male student talking about the mock exams that they have just taken. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, what did you think of the practice exams last week? You mean the mock exams? Yeah, I thought some of them were tough. They were certainly hard, and generally they were very long. Yeah, they were spread over a whole week, which made it impossible to relax. Exactly, but what did you think of each test? Of the seven exams we did. The least enjoyable for me were the two three-hour essay papers. Why didn't you like the essay papers? I'm not particularly good at writing things down like that in a short space of time, and I don't think it's a good way of testing our theoretical knowledge of medicine. I'm the opposite. I'm afraid, I'm much better in the written essay exams than the other types of tests. But what about the two multiple-choice exam papers in basic science and anatomy? They weren't too bad. If you didn't know the answer, all you had to do was guess.、Mm, 
that's okay, but I never feel comfortable with guessing. And you know that there is research that shows that women are disadvantaged when doing multiple choice questions compared to men. You've mentioned this before, but I'm not sure I believe it. It's true. Multiple choice questions benefit men more than women. They are a male construct. If you say so. It's not if I say so. Anyway, you have to be careful with multiple choice questions because of the negative marking. That can really bring the score down if you keep guessing and get all of the guesses wrong. It's double negative. Yeah, that is a danger. What about the role play? Did you like that? Yeah, with the actors and actresses as simulated patients. Yeah, I thought that was by far the best part of the exam. Why was that? What I liked about it was during the 24 test stations, we had a chance to show what we know about communicating with patients and show our practical medical knowledge, etc. Yes, I think I agree with you there. I enjoyed all of the stations, but I can tell you I was tired at the end. I have done a practice exam with 12 test stations, but not 24. It was exhausting, but also exhilarating. I agree completely. It lasted nearly four hours in total with the break. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What did you think of the other two exams? The two problem-solving tests? Hmm, I didn't think I was going to handle them very well. But in the end, I think they went better than I thought they would. What I liked most was the test where we had to work in groups of four and to solve a problem, we had to prioritise actions. That was very interesting. I'm not sure I did very well in that, though. Did you feel comfortable being in a group of four and having four examiners watching you as you discussed the problem? We did practice it several times before. You learn to forget that someone is watching you. But some people are better at speaking in group situations like that and they get the best marks. The test doesn't just assess whether people can talk a lot. It's about showing you can listen Organise your thoughts and then show you can be part of a team, allowing other people to speak. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. When do the results of the mocks come out? They said next week, and then it's the finals two weeks later. Yeah, we've got that to look forward to. What is the policy on resets? Why? Are you planning to fail? No, but, well, you know what I mean. The resets are held in September, and if there is any problem after that... It goes to appeal. We'll just have to make sure we don't fail any part of the whole examination. I certainly wouldn't want to do any of it again. Me neither. It's hard when you are not allowed to fail any of the exams. I bet they don't have that policy in any other subject. Probably not. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about the English policeman. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The English policeman has several nicknames, but the most frequently used are Copper and Bobby. The first name comes from the verb to cop, which is also slang, meaning to take or to capture. And the second comes from the first name of Sir Robert Peel, the 19th century politician who was the founder of the police force as we know it today. An early nickname for the policeman was Peeler, but this one has died out. Whatever we may call them, the general opinion of the police seems to be a favourable one, except, of course, among the criminal part of the community, where the police are given more derogatory nicknames which originated in America, such as Fuzz or Pig. Visitors to England seem nearly always to be very impressed by the English police. It has, in fact, become a standing joke that the visitor to Britain, when asked for his views of the country, will always say, at some point or other, I think your policemen are wonderful. Well, the British Bobby may not always be wonderful, but he is usually a very friendly and helpful sort of character. A music hall song of some years ago was called If You Want to Know the Time, Ask a Policeman. Nowadays, most people own watches, but they still seem to find plenty of other questions to ask the policeman. In London, the policemen spend so much of their time directing visitors about the city that one wonders how they ever find time to do anything else. Two things are immediately noticeable to the stranger when he sees an English policeman for the first time. The first is that he does not carry a pistol and the second is that he wears a very distinctive type of headgear, the policeman's helmet. His helmet, together with his height, enables an English policeman to be seen from a considerable distance, a fact that is not without its usefulness. From time to time it is suggested that the policeman should be given a pistol and that his helmet should be taken from him. But both these suggestions are resisted by the majority of the public and the police themselves. However, the police have not resisted all changes. Radios, police cars and even helicopters give them greater mobility now. The policeman's lot is not an enviable one even in a country which prides itself on being reasonably law-abiding. But, on the whole, the English policeman fulfils his often thankless task with courtesy and good humour, and with an understanding of the fundamental fact that the police are the country's servants, and not its masters. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.